Ladies and gentlemen, the informal meeting today for us here in the Health Ministry is the first highlight of the German EU Council Presidency. With this, we place emphasis on the important topic of the next half year of the German and the next one and a half years of the TRIO Presidency. And therefore, I'm very grateful that my colleagues from Portugal and Slovenia have come here to Berlin today because these two countries or our three countries will shape the presidency for the next one and a half years, that is 18 months. We will reach and achieve a lot of goals and we have a lot of uh, topics. We consider this task an opportunity. We want to pool the strengths of Europe in order to emerge from this crisis stronger than before. We want to pool our strengths in order to learn from our experiences from the, last, uh, from the past months and improve. Germany, together with our TRIO presidency partners, we can give decisive impetus on important topics. This is true for the European Council tomorrow, but this is also true for our informal meeting of health ministers today here in Berlin, or that is also with my colleagues from all over the continent on our web conference. We have discussed and we will continue discussing three topics. We have already discussed the strengthening of the European ECDC, the, Ger the European Robert Koch Institute. There was great support that this institution must be strengthened when it comes to its funding, but also when it comes to the recommendation, especially the smaller member states have emphasized how important a European institution like the ECDC is regarding recommendations and expertise. And for this, it needs um, means and funding. We also agreed that after a first review, we will draw some lesson learned from the crisis, also when it comes to the work of the ECDC and other institutions. And we will, on recommendation of the Commission, we will talk about as an expansion of the mandate uh, concerning the ECDC. And we want to discuss I, this idea and uh, decide uh, preferably. A second topic will be the stronger independence from the world market when it comes to specific pharmaceuticals. Of course, uh, medical devices such as uh, masks and respirators, but also pharmaceuticals. The EU must become more independent when it comes to the production of pharmace pharmaceuticals. And it is a quite a long-standing discussion. We have had it in the past two or three years, not only in Germany, but also in the EU. And therefore, we are very excited that the EU has announced to put forward a pharmaceutical strategy in the next months for the EU, a strategy that we will then discuss about with concrete measures. And we will focus on uh, specific uh, medicinal products that ma uh, we want to relocate to the EU. And of, uh, thirdly, we will also talk about the promo promotion of research. We want to find a common understanding on how we want to process and handle uh, health data. Health data are the most sensitive um, data that we have for all of our citizens here in Europe. At the same time, and we're seeing this during the crisis, a useful um, use of this data, a reasonable use of this data can um, create added value for our citizens in the EU, for example, in the field of research on cancer, for example, but also when it comes to patient mobility, such as electronic patient data and records, also when it comes to cross-border mobility. For this, it is crucial that all 27 member states have a common understanding um, how to process and use the data in the framework of the general protection of data regulation. This European health data space is to become our pillar or one of our priorities during our presidency and we have already discussed this these topics are quite big topics, of course, and we also want to talk about Europe's role in, in the world, in the WHO as well. These are topics that will, um, of course, need more than six months to discuss. 
and I'm all the more grateful that my two colleagues that will follow our presidency will then take up this role, Portugal and Slovenia. And I'm very grateful that they are here today so that we can set these topics and continue working on them. So I would now like to invite a minister for, of uh, Portugal to give her statement. Thomas, dear colleagues, I would like to start by thanking Minister Jan Spahn for the invitation to come to Berlin and for the excellent organization of this ministerial that we held in a hybrid format. Certainly, the physical presence of the trio here testifies to the progress normalization of our social life in Europe, which all our citizens have been missing so much. COVID-19 has reminded us we live in a deeply interconnected world where crises can only be overcome through dialogue and strengthened cooperation. In uh, the European Union, we already have the framework for such sustained interaction, one which takes place between democracies who promote the right to health of all their citizens equally, in particular the most vulnerable. What we have achieved with our meeting today is in this regard key. Central to public health are professional leadership, expertise and evidence-based data, which can inform properly political decisions and the collective action of governments. Thus, I am convinced that we move to agree on the need to strengthen the of the European Centre for Disease Control and Prevention by reinforcing the means on to become an even more valuable tool in preventing and countering global health crises. Thus, we fully endorse the proposals put forward by German presidents in this regard. The disruption of global supply chains of medical pr products that we felt as the coronavirus was reaching Europe cannot happen again. Depending exclusively on the global market for provision, uh, which are life savings, running the risk of shortages in our national health systems is not an option. Thus, it is essential that in the framework of the EU pharmaceutical strategy, we move on to implement measures that foster the medical sovereignty of Europe while avoiding nationalist prote protectionist moves. Increasing the transparency of medicines manufacturing, diversifying supply chains and relocating pharmaceutical production in Europe are part of the roadmap we have to follow to become more resilient. In line with the statement uh, we have issued towards a strong partnership between the EU, EU institutions and member states, we need effective answers to the health needs of patients and to foster the EU capacity and autonomy. Reinforcing funding and expanding instruments such as the EU for Health and Invest EU for this common purpose is a way of investing in our future, in the better health of our children, in the better health of our elderly. Our third and final session today will be devoted to the build-up of a European health data space, a EU-wide approach to data collection and sharing in the realm of public health is necessary to support the decision-making by health and regulatory bodies. We can draw on initiatives such as the eHealth Network to build a useful data infrastructure while fully respecting anonymity, privacy and personal self-determination. Finally, one word about the Portuguese Presidency's programme in the field of health. The cement between the trio partners is solid. We will persist in our shared goal of ensuring the economic and social recovery of Europe, at the heart of which lies the right of access to health. In our semester, we will focus the four main priorities, global health and its governance, health and climate change, universal, equitable and sustainable access to medicines, and finally, digital health. So, once again, thank you, colleagues. Let us continue working together. Thank you. The Slovenian Health Minister, Gantar, please. Thank you very much, distinguished colleagues, ministers, Marta, Jens, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would, of course, like to thank 
Germany and my colleague, Minister Spahn. Thank you for having organized this conference. And thank you also for giving us the possibility to meet in person after a really long time. Namely, personal exchange of experience is a much more pleasurable and effective one than sitting at conferences as such. COVID-19 is a disease that we will simply have to learn how to live with. The first steps have been taken in a more independent way in that context. However, in future, we would like to see a strength and cooperation. We are, of course, also counting on the support from organizations such as ECDC. We have reached almost a unanimous position in that respect. Most EU ministers for health agree that we will have to make sure that the ECDC has additional funding because in this respect, we will, of course, be able to receive expert knowledge, information. We will be able to invest more in research of this disease. If we will better able to monitor this disease, we will be able to prevent victims of it. What is of key importance is to exchange data between member states. These data are, of course, the basis for additional research for adopting measures, for adopting necessary measures that are needed if we want to live well, equally well in all member states. And if we want to live in a similar way than we did before the pandemic broke out. As I said, data exchange is of key importance, but this exchange of data has to be safe and secure. Slovenia would like to see this talks to continue. And during our presidency in the second half of 2021, we will be dealing with the issue of the data exchange. We are looking forward to the cooperation within the trio. I think that we will be able to take additional steps forward when it comes to dealing with COVID and when it comes to responding to it. Data exchange and providing data that is based on scientific findings is something that will help us strengthen also the role of our citizens. We will empower them because only an empowered patient can participate in our measures. And only in this way will we be able to achieve tangible results and reach what we want, that is to reestablish a normal way of life. An area that is very important for us when it comes to research, we have talked about research a lot also within the context of the ECDC. So we mentioned the spreading of the pandemic, how to prevent that, but we also touched upon preventive measures. We talked about vaccination. In this context, all member states of the European Union will, of course, have to participate. And I believe that in this area, we can take an important step forward within the next six months. What is also of crucial importance is the cooperation between the ECDC and the WHO. I believe that the cooperation has been relatively good up until now, and I'm convinced that they will continue to work together well, because this will help us to improve the results of the ECDC as well. At this point in time, I would of course like to thank again my German colleague, Thank you, Jens, again for this invitation. I wish you a lot of success in your future work, and I'm also looking forward to our cooperation. Thank you. Abschließend die EU Gesundheitskommissarin Kyriak. And finally, the European Commissioner Kyriakidis. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank Minister Spahn for dedicating this first ministerial meeting of his presidency of the Council to the COVID-19 crisis and the lessons that we have learned and are learning from it. I also very much welcome the presence of Ministers Penigo and Gantar, with whom I will continue to take this important work forward over the next year. Our discussion today comes at a crucial point in the management of the most severe health crisis of modern times. Across Europe, citizens have been facing a challenge like no other in generations. 
And whilst we're still in the middle of this pandemic, with all our efforts focusing on bringing the virus under control, suppressing transmission and saving lives, we also need to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Now is the time to start the reflection on what we have learned and what needs to be handled better, differently in the future. In this respect, I would like to mention two key points. Firstly, we need stronger EU agencies. The European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, as well as the European Medicines Agency, have played a significant role over the past months in supporting the member states to handle this crisis. They are key in our future work, but only if they have the right capacities and the right mandate. ECDC needs to be able to work proactively to anticipate. It needs to have the capacity to support with emergency capacities and be in a position to give clear recommendations to member states, and we are already working on this. The European Medicines Agency needs to be in a position to anticipate shortages through permanent mechanisms for monitoring and reporting and have a stronger role when it comes to development, authorization and safety monitoring of therapeutics and vaccines. And its role is even more important in, in relation to the current pharmaceutical strategy we will be announcing at the end of 2020. But we cannot stop at reinforcing ECDC and EMMA. And this brings me to my second point. We need a new framework at EU level to prepare and manage health threats. We need to be able to act more rapidly. And in my view, we should be able to trigger or recommend the implementation of preparedness and response measures. I have the intention to look and the examination of a revision of the current decision on cross-border threats to health. This could allow for the development of an EU health crisis preparedness system. In the coming months, we are all hands on deck and are all focusing our efforts on avoiding any resurgences and keeping localized outbreaks isolated. And this is why we had the communication yesterday. But we cannot allow this to delay what, we are, what are crucial and necessary reforms that will reinforce and increase our resilience and our preparedness. This afternoon, we'll be discussing the pharmaceutical strategy, which will be reinforcing Europe's strategic autonomy, and we'll be discussing how e-health can bring benefits to all EU citizens and health professionals through our health data space. I look forward to these discussions and thank you once again for your attention. Vielen Dank, Frau Kyriakidis. Thank you very much, Ms. Kyriakidis. We would now like to give you the floor for your questions. Please state who you would like to ask. Ms. Beerheide. Thank you very much. My question is to Minister Spahn. You said that the European agency needs additional funding. Could you possibly uh, mention a figure, how much that would be, also considering that the European financial framework is currently being discussed? How much money should be allocated to expanding this agency? I understand that you would like to hear exact figures at this point. Nonetheless, today we are only starting also in the framework of all ministers of health and the commission. For the first time, we talked in detail about possibly expanding the mandate of the ECDC. We will now compile our opinions from the different statements that we have heard. We clearly saw that there is a large wish to have sufficient expertise to be able to make recommendations for the member states, to also have digital solutions to streamline data, to collect data. This could also be happen at regional level, at the member state level, but these then need to be compiled. And there is the wish to establish a health task force within the ECDC, a task force that has sufficient expertise and support that in the case of a regional outbreak is able to act because there are not outbreaks that affect all member states equally. And then this should also 
be um, possible to act beyond Europe. We, for instance, have seen that the American CDC, uh, the equivalent of our ECDC, um, also reacted to outbreaks in Congo of the Ebola disease. And we could act in a similar way with our ECDC. We are already active at member state level, but we should have similar approaches to the CDC. We have seen that we need more resources, we need more stuff, but it will be decided only within the next month how much exactly. Ms. Hirsch. Minister Spahn, I would like to ask a similar question. You said you need more resources and more staff, but you also mentioned that you want to change responsibilities, change the mandate, give more competency to the agency. I'd like to know what this means, also with regard to national sovereignty. And if I may, a second question on your uh, medicinal products strategy. What kind of substances of medicinal products do you want to uh, have manufactured in Germany or in Europe? Well, when it comes to the suggestions for the mandate of the ECDC, I'd like to state the following. Uh, our suggestions have already been very precise, I think. We will then find a wording within a legal text. I'm very thankful for the Commissioner's work and support and her announcement that we just heard. She also said so in our Council. We will work on this legal text and implement it uh, accordingly. And I would like to explicitly state that when we say we need more funding, we need more staff, this also applies to the EU in general. We need more. I think this is in line with the position of many member states. We need more uh, Europe, we need more European added value also when it comes to the budget. There are plenty areas where we try to um, assess how much do we pay, how much do we get out of it at member state level. However, I think it is very important that beyond these aspects there should be areas where we not only look into what we pay and what we get, but see the benefit of European added value, which could, for instance, be uh, such a mandate. I think this can really make a difference. Marta and Tomas also underlined that it is particularly those member states that do not have a uh, Institut Pasteur or a Robert Koch Institute like we do in France and Germany should be capable of benefiting from this to have additional capacities at the European level. So we need to consider other member states perspective as well when it comes to the ECDC. This is a matter of solidarity. However, as I've already mentioned, I cannot name any exact figures. This will be discussed in the next months. Now uh, regarding the European pharmaceutical strategy. Our motto is the European health sovereignty for our presidency. This is what we want to achieve. We want to have less dependence and more strength from within at the European level. So the European pharmaceutical strategy now means that we together need to define what the uh, APIs are that we want to see being manufactured within the European Union. What we need here is additional funding. We might also look into the necessity of price guarantees, of uh, government support, all of this. In the afternoon, we will start the discussion on this. We will have a rather abstract debate on how to reach sovereignty. And this will then be um, supported by more detailed measures. Um, and we will look into what kind of APIs we can produce here. We will never be able to produce all APIs in Europe. I don't think we necessarily have to, but we need to prioritize what is required for um, intensive care. Mr. Rinke, so first of all, one question towards the Commissioner. The Commission is now responsible for the purchase of um, medic medicinal products against coronavirus. What do you think are the biggest problems? Is it a funding problem or 
what is the problem when it comes to the procurement of vaccines and medicinal products? And the next question towards uh, for Mr. Ganta, especially in the Western Balkans, we see a rise of infections of with corona. What is your response to this? Shall we, um, will we see new um, border controls and border locks? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there are two scales to that question. First of all, in terms of the medicines, uh, even before the COVID-19 crisis, we were very aware that there were issues to do with the uh, with access to medicines, with shortages, and also affordability. And this is why it is uh, uh, one of the priorities of this commission and of President von der Leyen to have a pharmaceutical strategy uh, in the current year. These. Um, the problems and difficulties were further highlighted by COVID-19. I would say that there's a variety of reasons why we have uh, issues to do with uh, shortages and affordability, and we'll be addressing them in the pharmaceutical strategy to be presented uh, at the end of this year. In terms of the issue to do with vaccines, as you know, the European Commission has uh, moved forward with all 27 member states with the European strategy for vaccines. We are at present uh, in negotiations uh, with the um, uh, industry, with member states, uh, in partnership with member states, in order to be able to have access to uh, a vaccine uh, or vaccines as quickly as possible, uh, of, uh, available uh, in an equitable way to all uh, vaccines that are going to be safe. And this is, uh, um, a commitment that we have made as a commission that we are going to leave no stone unturned in the in the areas of either therapeutics or vaccines in dealing with this pandemic. Thank you. Yeah. Well, when it comes to Croatia, I have to say that the cooperation is extremely good at the level of epidemiological services. We have met a couple of days ago. The situation in Croatia at this point in time indicates that there are about 25 infected on 100,000 citizens. That's the trend in the past 14 days. What is more worrisome is that the number of infected is on the uprise. If the situation continues to worsen, then of course we will have to adopt certain measures and take certain decisions. However, we will have to do all of that in cooperation and in agreement with the neighboring country. In Croatia, there are areas where the number of infected is very low. But in certain areas where there are people coming from Serbia, Montenegro, and Macedonia, the number of infected is rather high. Therefore, if they manage to limit the income of infections from the aforementioned countries, then Croatia will be able to better control the situation in Croatia, and we will not be forced to adopt any strict measures. We all need to adapt, but we also don't want to repeat the mistakes from the past months when borders were closed. I believe that Croatia is a responsible country, and of course, after the elections, they will know how to take appropriate measures and adopt appropriate decisions in order to control the spread of infection. I can add to a um, question from Politico. Uh, do you agree with the plan of uh, WHO um, Director Tedros? that they will look at the work and the, t uh, the, the, the work done by the WHO. So first of all, when it comes to reappraising the work of the WHO during the crisis, on Tuesday I had the opportunity to speak with Tedros in Paris and as well uh, two weeks ago in Geneva. And in both talks, I uh, encouraged him to do this independent um, commission and to do this swiftly, it is important. Yes, the pandemic is still going on, but even during the pandemic, we can already draw some lessons learned because the time must be used in order to learn from this crisis and 
we um, can make already some good me uh, measures and take some action, for example, when it comes to governance, but also the cooperation between the political level and the scientific level in within the WHO. But at the same time, it is important that the member states are all involved in this process. Um, apart from the independent panel of experts, it is important to have a track where the member states can um, share their experiences. WHO can only be as good as the member states let it be. And therefore, um, is there, it is important that there is the willingness to share information in case of an outbreak. How also, uh, how big is the um, willingness to give further funding? The non-governmental partners, of course, play such an important role because um, state members do not contribute um, the funding that it would be necessary. And therefore, we need both. We need the independent expert group, but we also need the um, engagement and the dedication of the member states. Concerning a second wave, a second outbreak, I am very grateful that the Commission has addressed this topic yesterday. For us in Europe, it is important to secure what we have already achieved. Under great expenses in all member states, we have achieved what we have now. We can now say that the pandemic and the outbreaks are under control. That is what we have today. But we see how fast we can have further outbreaks and further new infections if we are less careful in, in some situation. And therefore, it is our common task, and this is what our citizens want from us, that, what we, that, that we secure what we have achieved already under the great expenses of our economy and of our citizens. And therefore, we need to be prepared. We need uh, um, comprehensive testing, as we are doing already in Europe. We need to be prepared also when it comes to protective gear, uh, also respirators and masks for our per medicinal, uh, medical personnel. We also need uh, greater coordination and communication and um, help within our member states. But we also, I'm very convinced that a second wave that cannot be excluded will not be happen overnight. We will see it coming and emerging. And that is when we are testing and when we are very careful and attentive. And I think we are, we are in all 27 member states. Question from the Süddeutsche Zeitung to Ms. Kyriakidis and Mr. Spahn. How are the experiences with the corona apps in Europe? And is there the idea of a cross-border corona app? Ms. Kyriakidis, maybe you can start. Ich wiederhole die Frage. Ich wiederhole die Frage. I can repeat the question. I will re repeat the question. What are the experiences with the several Corona apps in Europe, and is there a suggestion or proposal for a cross-border Corona app? Yes, we have it. We have at present uh, ten member states who are uh, using uh, Corona apps, and another eleven are looking. Uh, at, at the potential of this coming in very soon. At the moment, these apps are not uh, interoperable across borders, but we are working very closely with the member states in order to achieve this as soon as possible. Yeah, I can. Vielleicht. Oh, well, I can add on this. I'm very grateful that the EU Commission has um, taken up this task. Of course, we had a amendment of the legal test that makes it possible to have an European solution. In the core, we need a back end, a server, where all the different apps have an interface and are connected via this interface. This is challenging because we have different concepts. Uh, France, for example, have a more centralized approach when it comes to um, data, for example. We here in Germany have a decentralized approach. There are different reasons to it, but it makes it quite challenging to interact, to make these apps interact, and therefore it is grateful that we take up this task. 
I would like to add that the app that we have here in Germany is provided via the Robert Koch Institute, and it is available in all EU member states in the uh, app stores in German, English, and Turkish, and it will also be launched in French and Russian, Romanian, Bulgarian. And with this, we make a contribution for EU citizens in Germany, but also beyond, to use this app. But of course, it also makes a difference when we can interconnect um, those apps via an interface, via a back end that might be operated by the Commission. I'm very grateful for their work. Last question by Mr. Pohl. ID Magazine Contraste. Mr. Spahn, there is a great gap between the uh, intensive care unit beds. Uh, that is pa that paid by the government and the one and the the number of beds that are on your list it's about 7000 beds that cannot be found in the registry what do you say about this discrepancy first of all we also discussed this um, in an informal setting during our dinner about the situation that we experienced in february and march the question was, do we have enough capacity for intensive care units and uh, ventilation? Of course, this was a question that we were all concerned about. With our federal lender and the federal government, we decided in the midst of March, uh, some months ago, we agreed to double the number of intensive care unit beds, and we uh, provided great incentives for that. And of course, this can be accounted for in a very transparent way. Of course, this was we had to make very swift de decisions and swift actions. We wanted to expand the capacities in a very swift way, and therefore we launched the program very quickly. But we also said afterwards we, we need to evaluate it, and it all, everything needs to be accountable if these investment funding uh, was used and was used to um, double the number of intensive care unit beds. Of course, we support, we are also contributors to the insurance funds. We support, but the support must be used in the way that we intended. We've seen, uh, I've I've written a letter, or that my state secretary wrote a letter to all health ministries of our federal lender that we will evaluate the situation and look at the discrepancies between, between the numbers, and we will do so. This is what we owe to all contributors. But at the same time, we want to do it in a way that uh, we look at that time as a time where we had to make swift decisions. Looking at my watch, I think we have come to the end of this press conference. I would like to ask.